Back in 1916, the superintendent of a rural school district in West Virginia had a problem. The schools were bad, the roads were bad, and nobody seemed to care. The superintendent realized that if he ordered people to get engaged and fix their problems, they'd probably simply ignore him. So instead, he worked with the teachers to organize a series of social events, picnics, school concerts, athletic competitions, and storytelling evenings. The rural residents came out for these social events, and they had fun. And through having fun, they formed connections and began to trust each other. And this social capital that they built started to pay dividends. Once having formed connections and trust, the rural people began to raise money for school libraries and advocate for better roads. West Virginia school superintendent Lydia Hannafan first coined the term social capital in 1916. He wrote, in the use of the phrase social capital, I do not refer to real estate or to personal property or to cold cash but rather to that in life which tends to count foremost in the daily lives of people, namely goodwill, fellowship, mutual sympathy, and social intercourse amongst a group of individuals and families who make up the rural community. Since Hannafan coined the term social capital in the early 1900s, hundreds of scholars have adopted the phrase, sometimes with quite different definitions. I like to divide these different definitions into two categories what I call the I social capital and what I call the we social capital. The French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu talked about the I social capital. He used the term to describe how people with more connections are able to secure more benefits. I'm going to tell you a short personal story to illustrate the I social capital. When I applied to Cornell as an undergraduate, my cousin was a lecturer at the university. She knew, one, she knew someone who worked in the admissions office and when I came to visit, she set me up with an interview with the admission officers. So I guess that maybe that interview was one of the reasons I got into Cornell. In short, I knew my cousin, and she was connected to the admissions officer who granted me the interview and enabled me to access a good education. Compared to Bourdieu and to me when I was trying to get into college, Hannafan was more interested in public goods, good schools, good roads, healthy communities. Two more recent scholars are important in this we tradition of social capital. First is Robert Putnam at Harvard University. If Robert Putnam wanted to know what was the level of social capital in your community or city, he would ask you and others questions like, do you volunteer to help the needy or for a cause you believe in? Do you attend a church, synagogue, a mosque, or other faith-based institution? How often do you visit your neighbors? And do you trust people in your community who are different from you, such as from a different ethnic group or race? Putnam would then compile your score on these social capital attributes along with the scores of others in your community. And he'd come up with an aggregate level of social capital or local social capital. Through numerous studies, Putnam and his colleagues have determined that high levels of social capital are associated with many benefits, such as good school systems, lower crime rates, and good governance. According to Putnam, for a variety of reasons, life is easier in a community blessed with a substantial stock of social capital. The second very important scholar in the we tradition of social capital was Eleanor Ostrom, who taught at Indiana University and was the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize in economics. At the time Ostrom began her work in the 1960s, the prevailing belief was that when a group of people depended on a common resource for their livelihood, such as a fishery, they would eventually drive that resource to extinction. By overexploiting their resources, they would create a so-called tragedy of the commons. This is because each individual benefits from exploiting that resource. If the fisherman catches more fish, he and his family will prosper. Because each individual benefits from catching more fish, everyone fishes until there are no fish left. But Ostrom observed that in some communities, people who depended on a fishery or other resource for their livelihood actually did not overexploit the resource, but somehow rather managed the resource for the collective good. She and her colleagues asked, what are the conditions present in a village that manages its fishery or other resource sustainably? Osterman and her colleagues found that one of the factors present in communities that manage common pool resources for the collective good is social connections and trust. 
or social capital. So we've come full circle from Lydda Hannafan, working in rural West Virginia, who observed that by building social capital, people are more likely to work for the benefit of the larger community, to Eleanor Ostrom, who found that communities with high levels of social capital are more likely to manage a common pool resource for the collective good. So what does social capital have to do with civic ecology practices? We can predict that if you and other people in your neighborhood were to convert a vacant lot into a community garden, or come together to remove tires, plastic bottles, and other rubbish from a local river, you probably have a certain level of trust and social connectivity, or social capital. But through working together in a civic ecology practice, you also would build trust and social connections. In other words, like so many civic ecology processes, the relationship between stewardship and social capital can be thought of as a feedback loop. An initial level of social capital is needed for a civic ecology practice to emerge. And then more social capital is built through the civic ecology practice. And this leads to further benefits or dividends for the larger community.